The world's oceans are a vast, untapped energy resource. Waves off the coast of the U.S. could theoretically generate 2.64 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity per year. That's about 64% of last year's total utility-scale electricity generation in the U.S. We won't need that much, but one day experts do hope that wave energy will comprise about 10 to 20% of our electricity mix. So wave power is really the last missing piece to help us to transition to 100% renewables. But while scientists have long understood the power of waves, it's proven difficult to build devices that can harness that energy. So the ocean is a, a challenging, challenging environment to work in. It's a challenging environment to build infrastructure in. It moves, sometimes violently. It, it's corrosive. Now, though, an influx of federal funding is helping many U.S. companies gear up to test their latest wave energy converters. As the nation's first full-scale, grid-connected test facility for these technologies, called PacWave, is set to come online over the next few years. PacWave really represents for us an opportunity to address one of the most critical barriers to enabling wave energy, and that's getting devices into the open ocean. That will help the U.S. catch up with its European counterparts, who've been testing wave energy devices off the coast of Scotland since the early 2000s. But while many prototypes have been developed, it's still unclear what technology will prove viable for grid-scale electricity production. There are just this vast uh, array of approaches to turning oscillatory motion into ultimately electrical power. We spoke with a number of companies pursuing different technologies and learned how this emergent energy source could help us transition to an all-renewable world, if we can get it to work at scale. Besides the fact that the ocean is a rough environment, the very nature of waves themselves means harnessing their energy is much less straightforward than, say, wind or hydropower. Winds and currents, they go in one direction. It's very easy to spin a turbine or a, a windmill when you've got linear movement. Uh, the waves really aren't linear, they're oscillating. And so what we have to be able to do is turn this oscillatory energy into some sort of capturable form. There are a number of different ways to do this. But generally speaking, devices work by harnessing the up and down, back and forth, or rotational motion of the waves to drive a generator to create electricity. Some companies are now attempting to harness energy from multiple different modes of motion. And what we don't really know uh, is which of those is best uh, in a real world full scale system. One technology might work really well for large, slow, open ocean swells. Another technology might work really well for choppy or wind wave kinds of energy. If wave energy proves to be scalable, it has the potential to be an excellent complement to wind and solar, since it can produce energy 24-7 in all weather conditions. And while wind and solar production peak in the spring and summer respectively, waves are more powerful and consistent in the winter. But the infrastructure required to scale up any of these systems and connect them to the power grid is complex and expensive. So if you're building, let's say, a wave energy plant offshore, you're going to have to build your mooring and anchoring systems out offshore. Cables will then go from your, your wave energy converter down to a subsea cable where you probably have a sort of a junction box where you might plug 10, 20, 50 devices in with one larger export cable that will then run along the seafloor. But when it gets close to shore, you'll have to drill it under the seabed and under the surf zone because that's a very active environment and then pop up in a location on shore. PacWave, the Department of Energy funded wave energy test site off the Oregon coast, is building this infrastructure now. It's a collaborative effort between the DOE, Oregon State University, the National Renewable Energy Lab, the European Marine Energy Center, and a host of other marine energy experts. The facility is fully pre-permitted, so companies can trial their prototypes without concern about regulatory delays. The Department of Energy has funded eight different companies to start deploying a pack wave beginning in 2024, and we can't wait to have them on site. This is really a seismic shift in the wave energy community. In the U.S., the DOE has been funding marine energy for about a decade, a category which not only includes wave power, but also power generated from currents, tides, and temperature changes. During that period of time, we've spent probably around $500 million or so on, on marine energy. But this year, we actually saw a record amount for our office, specifically for marine energy, $112 million in 2022. And this also includes an additional $110 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law. And at the beginning of this year, the DOE announced $25 million in funding for eight wave energy projects, which will comprise the first round of technologies to be tested at the PacWave facility. Of the eight projects, Bay Area-based CalWave received the largest amount, $7.5 million. A small-scale version of CalWave's device recently returned after a successful 10-month deployment off the coast of San Diego. 
Yeah, the device we're testing at Puckwave will be a larger version of this, so nearly double the size and 10 times the amount of power. And so this unit specifically was able to power about 30 households. The X800, our megawatt class system, yeah, produces enough power to power about um, yeah, 3,000 households. So our, our target is 20-year deployments at sea, and I think that's very achievable with maintenance interventions about every four to five years. CalWave's tech is classified as a submerged pressure differential device. It operates completely below the surface of the water, and as waves rise and fall, surge forward and backward, and the water moves in a circular motion, the device moves too. Dampers inside the device slow down that motion and convert it into torque, which drives a generator to produce electricity. Lehman likens it to how electric cars recharge when braking. As the electric car goes downhill and you put on the brake, it would produce power. And so the waves move the system up and down, and every time it moves down, we can generate power. That oscillating motion we can turn into electricity, just like a wind turbine. Seattle-based Oscillopower was awarded $1.8 million from the DOE, and it's getting ready to deploy its wave energy converter off the coast of Hawaii at the U.S. Navy Wave Energy Test Site. While this facility is smaller than the planned Packway facility, it's currently the nation's only grid-connected site for tech like this. The system that we're deploying in Hawaii is what we call the Triton C. This is uh, about a third of the size of our flagship product. Uh, it's designed to be 100 kilowatt rated, and it's designed for islands and small communities. Nair and many others are excited by Wave Energy's potential to generate electricity for remote regions, which rely on expensive and polluting diesel imports to meet their energy needs. Oscilla Power uses a technology known as a two-body point absorber. Part of the Triton C floats on the surface and moves with the waves in all directions, up and down, side to side, and rotationally. Underneath the float hangs a large ring-shaped structure, which stays relatively steady, thus generating force on the lines that connect it to the float. That force is then used to rotate a gearbox to drive a generator. So under very weak waves, we get a lot of pitch and roll motion in our system. At very strong waves, we get a lot of surge motion. And in the most prevalent wave climate, we get a lot of heave motion. That's up and down motion. So across all of these, the system certainly moves enough uh, for us to be able to capture energy efficiently across a wide range of climate. Asilo Power plans to deploy a larger megawatt scale device in India in 2024, and then move on to testing at PackWave. The DOE also awarded Charlottesville, Virginia-based company SeaPower over $4 million to develop and test its grid-scale wave energy converter, the Stingray, at PackWave. But before that testing takes place, the company is focused on commercializing its smaller-scale system, the Sea-Ray, designed for lower power applications. Think about sensors in the ocean, research, mid-ocean data gathering, maybe it's monitoring or inspection. The next step, Liesman says, is powering ocean robotics and operating equipment. And then you think about diesel genset replacement for island power. Then we start to work our way towards charging networks for autonomous surface vessels, and then eventually to terrestrial to, to grid applications. The Sea Ray consists of two floats and a central body, then a cell, which contains the drivetrain. As waves pass by, the floats bob up and down, rotating about the nacelle and turning their own respective gearboxes, which power the electric generators. We have a, a Sea Ray that will be deployed off the coast of Hawaii this fall. And that's a two kilowatt version. We've got a number of customers that are involved with us. Saab is one who's one of the global leaders from a subsea robotics perspective. Biosonics is another with a static data gathering system. After these initial applications, SeaPower will work on scaling up its sea ray so that it's compatible with satellite communications and deep water deployments before building a 200 kilowatt stingray to test at PackWave. The European Marine Energy Center, or EMEC, was the first test site in the world for wave and tidal technologies when it opened in 2003. We've had something like 35 different devices in the water from 22 different companies from, I think, 11 different countries. Some of those include Finnish company Wello Oi, which produced power for the grid in Scotland during its two deployments at EMEC and has subsequently been deployed in Spain, and Scottish company Palamas which became the first offshore wave energy converter to produce power for a national grid in 2004. It was also the first to be purchased by a utility company, though financial troubles ultimately forced the company to cease operations. While EMEC has seen its share of successes and disappointments, no company has yet commercialized a grid-scale wave energy converter, so Kermode is more than happy to see more players and more testing facilities popping up. We firmly believe that this is an international endeavor and 
we're not going to win this just because some people on a small Scottish island managed to crack this. This will be dealt with because the, the scientific and technical community has really put its shoulder to this and found a way to make it work. But while PackWave and EMEC are focusing on testing offshore devices, one Swedish company, EcoWave Power, thinks it will be quite a while before these complex devices can reliably produce power. I would like to see more companies focusing on easier projects that will give the population, the investors, the government, the safety to say, OK, now it's safe to legislate, now it's safe to invest, now it's safe to, to believe in wave energy. That's why EcoWave Power is installing onshore devices on breakwaters, piers, and jetties. The only thing in our technology that is in the water are the floaters, which belong in the water. All the expensive conversion machinery is on land, just like a regular power station. So basically, this enables a very low installation, operation, and maintenance cost. As a floater moves up and down with the motion of the waves, it drives a hydraulic piston, which compresses fluid that's then stored in an accumulator. When the fluid is released, it turns a hydraulic motor, which powers an electric generator. While nearshore and onshore waves aren't as powerful as offshore waves, Braverman says that current technologies aren't able to fully take advantage of that extra energy potential, meaning the energy produced from her company's floaters is on par with the offshore competition. EcoWave Power produced power for the grid in Gibraltar for six years, powering around 100 homes with its 100 kilowatt system when operating at peak efficiency. The company is finalizing another 100 kilowatt grid connected station in Israel and has signed an agreement to install its devices at the port of Los Angeles starting with a 100 kilowatt installation and hoping to scale to 15 megawatts, which could power about 15,000 homes. There are still many unknowns when it comes to wave energy tech, including whether costs can fall enough to become competitive with fossil fuels. In order for marine energy to be competitive, we need to be at cost parity with solar and wind or offshore wind. So really driving at that less than six cents a kilowatt hour. But that's a long way away. The projections for the levelized cost of energy for the wave energy devices are, you know, 60 cents, 80 cents, a dollar per kilowatt hour. Wave energy has really struggled to get solid deployment at the moment, mainly, to be brutally honest, because hydrocarbons have been so cheap. And while there are ongoing efforts by the DOE and the companies themselves to monitor the impact of their devices on marine ecosystems, it will take time to get a full picture of the impact. Really, this is going to have to be something that we learn as we put systems into the water. But we're funding, you know, environmental monitoring, funding work to really understand the interaction of species uh, with deployed systems, and we take this very seriously. Questions about potential environmental impacts could delay the permitting process as companies move beyond testing and attempt to commercialize. One thing that could make permitting easier, though, is if there's convergence around a particular design principle. There are different applications that require somewhat different approaches, but I think for the mainstream, you will see some form factor convergence. Right now, though, it's far from clear what technology will rise to the top for grid-scale electricity generation. But in the meantime, experts say that there are many exciting low-power opportunities. Data gathering, subsea robotics, uh, operating equipment, that's today. That's ready to go today. Next, many point to places in the Arctic, like Kodiak Island in Alaska, as potential early adopters of the tech, since there's so little solar power there in the winter, and the community relies on expensive diesel generators for power. Estimates vary for how long it will take before we see wave farms providing power to the mainland, but most agree that it won't be this decade. So we have a, a goal of setting about one gigawatt of power by 2035. And we really see that as the first opportunity for wave energy to come online to serve the nation's grid. Scale-up will largely depend upon continued government support in the U.S. and abroad. The recent passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes $369 billion earmarked for clean energy and climate change mitigation, has many optimistic. But Kermode says that globally, we need to be even more aggressive about getting these devices in the water. It does take time to do this. The question is, do we have time? And so do we need to get at this harder than we are at the moment? And I would suggest we really, really do need to be quite aggressive in what we're doing and really push hard.